We're going to go ahead and get started. I know we'll have some people coming in from the fellowship hall that are putting stuff out, but uh, we're going to go ahead and get things going because uh, we do have senior stuff at the end of worship this morning to take care of all the potluck. So uh, before we get started, it probably help Daniel if I turn the microphone on so he can hear. There we go. Uh, read your Bible every day. There's an app on your phone. There's passages on the back of the prayer request list. You got two ways you can do that. So no excuses. Next, pray for the school every day. Our teachers are still up. This Might be their two favorite days. I don't know. But two days left for them. But some will be teaching summer school. There's still uh, sporting events and stuff happening during the summer. A lot of travel. So continue to pray for the school. Uh, there's a lot of decisions and planning that happens during the summer. Uh, so pray for that as well. Pray for our students. Uh, we got students, teachers to be traveling all over the place, pray for their safety during the summer, and that God will already be blessing the new school year that will begin uh, in August. Uh, next, CYE. Next work day, final work day before junior week is May 28th. So if you can make it to help us, we'd greatly appreciate it. Uh, we're getting a lot closer to where we need to be. But even once camp begins, we're, we'll be able to have camp. But everything won't be perfect. And I know Dwayne has already told me that him and Brian are going to be out there all of junior week. Uh, he told me, add, add our names to the background checklist, because we background check everybody now that's going to be out there, adults. And he said, all right, our names, because we're going to be out there all junior week uh, working on stuff, uh, you know, piddling here and there, just to try to get things back to where they need to be. But Saturday, we're going to be out there, last designated scheduled work day. Now, if you want to go on a day that's not the 28th, I'll give you Dwayne's number. He'll be happy to, to set it up and tell you what he needs done out there. He's out there a whole bunch. Even though he lives in Denham Springs, he spends the, the balance of most weeks over at camp now that he's retired trying to get everything done. So if you want to go over there uh, and it's not a work day, give him a call. He'll be glad to have extra help on non-work days. Uh, next, stewardship class next Saturday in the Fellowship Hall, May 29th. Uh, we're going to be talking about debt. I know that's a fun topic, but uh, something that you need to prepare yourself on how to manage the, the money that God gives you, the resources God gives you. So that's going to be next Sunday after church in the Fellowship Hall. Also mentioned, there's going to be a singing at Cyprus at two o'clock. Uh, I'm gonna, we'll, usually we're done by 1:30, usually 1:15, 1:30. So I'm gonna try to make it to that. One note: if you're gonna go to the singing in Cyprus, don't go the back way because uh, I said the back way. Don't go the direct route because the bridge is out. So you're gonna have to go down to Oakdale and over to get to Cyprus rather than down to where the bridge is out. So just remember that if you plan on going to Cyprus next week. Feasting on the Word. This week, uh, we're going to continue through Philippians. We talked about Philippians 1 last week. We're going to talk about the Christ hymn in Philippians 2, one of my favorite passages. I'll just give you a synopsis right now. We mess things up by trying to be God. We try to reach for things that didn't belong to us. Jesus remedies that by letting go of what was rightfully his. Uh, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but rather empty himself. Uh, it's a beautiful passage, and the reason I call it the Christ hymn is some people think that that was actually uh, what Paul uses there and alludes to is actually a song that was sung in Christian communities early on. But regardless of its origins, it's a beautiful statement about who Christ is. We're going to be looking at that Wednesday. We eat at 6.30, and then we begin our time at 7 o'clock. Senior Sunday, that's today, and we've got our ground with us, uh, Abby and Ben and Morgan. And so at the end of uh, worship, once we conclude, I uh, want you to stay where you're at. We got a, a slideshow, it's about 10 minutes of life. And then after that, we're going to uh, pray over them. And we'll move over to the fellowship hall where we have uh, we have some like a display set up, just kind of shows you uh, what their life as a student has been like. And then we, oh, we got food too. So uh, we'll, we'll move over there and eat. Uh, but that's today. So today's the day we've chosen to, to celebrate our seniors. Uh, next, uh, communion contributions. We still got the old way. I'll say the old way. The way that we've been doing it all through COVID, where you can get the individual communion tray uh, servings, or you can put your offering in the, the the box back there, or we've got the trays, the traditional way, and the offering plate. So either way you want to give, take communion, but we've got it both ways so that people are comfortable doing so. All right, that's all the announcements I have. Before uh, Ben leads us in worship, uh, I'd like for you to stand. I'm going to read to you from Psalm 67. <clears throat> God be gracious to us and bless us and cause his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy, for you will judge the peoples with fairness on the earth. 
May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its produce. God, our God, blesses us. God blesses us so that all the ends of the earth may fear him. Let's worship God together. There is beyond the edge of blue, a God concealed from human sight. He tends his skies with heavenly dew and framed the worlds with his great mind. There is a God, he is alive in him. Lord, let my feet on my 
Oh 
Savior Jesus Christ and the ultimate sacrifice that he made so that we can have eternal salvation. We take the, the emblem, the bread, which represents his broken body, and the cup which represents his blood. We bow with me, I'll give you. I thank you for the Lord. Father in heaven, we again thank you for this time, Lord, that we have to gather around this table in remembrance of your son, Jesus Christ. And the sacrifice that was made for us. If we take of the loaf, which represents his body, we'd ask that we do so in a manner complete. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
I demonstrate to Heavenly Father, thank you this day that we can come this to your word, Heavenly Father. And thank you for your son who paid the ultimate sacrifice for dying uh, down the cross for the wipe of our sins. Uh, bless this cup, represents his blood that was shed uh, on the cross. It was crazy to fall in that. Amen. Separate and apart from the Lord's Supper, we take this time to give back a portion of what we've been blessed with. Before we uh, pass it off the plate for him, I ask Brother Bo if he would bless the offer. <coughs> Father, we truly do thank you for all the blessings that you give to us every day. We thank you for your love and mercy that we have in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, 
that you'll bless this offering. Hearts of those who give, that they may do so in a free and willing spirit, so that it can be used to spread the good news of the gospel of salvation and the love of Jesus Christ throughout our community and throughout the world. In the name of Jesus we ask. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see everyone out this morning. Uh, before we get into our prayer request, let's go ahead and dismiss the kids, seven and under, for the children's home. I'd like to encourage everyone to read over our list. Uh, quite a few names on here. Uh, let's update our uh, bulletin if it's possible. Uh, some of these, uh, I think, they have been removed, but we failed to uh, take them off. But uh, anyway, read over and let's see if we can update our list. Uh, keep it current. We want to be sure everybody's on there that needs to be on there also. So. Do you have anything you want to add? Uh, any events you have coming up? Give for Justin to be more than happy to put it in the bulletin for you. As far as the most recent request, uh, we have Austin, uh, Alyssa and her baby, uh, Patrick Perry, uh, Anna Bowers, Sheila Richmond, Daddy Dozot, Lizzie Brothers, Ken Cloud, Ashley Daldridge, uh, Donald Deville. Uh, I think he improved to have me. He said he might have had a second. Um, Michelle, those are Alton Cloud, Eddie Gore, George and Juanita Reeves, and there's quite a few others. So I'll encourage you to read over them. And those in the bold print have probably been on the list before, but have had setbacks. So we need to remember them also. Those on the continued list, uh, remember them. And uh, those in the military and their families also. Cancer patients and caregivers will be in prayer for them. Those people in the nursing homes will be in prayer for them, and uh, people who care for these individuals also. We have those on the bereaved list uh, the Roman family, uh, Brasso, Poon, Stanley, Robinson, Hunt, Franklin, Babb, and the East families. This will be in prayer for them and uh, comfort for them. Is there anyone else you'd like to add? Roger and Liz are leaving again Saturday. They don't like to stay home very much. So they're, um, they're going to Texas and Missouri, I think, Kansas City. So. Okay. All right. Taylor and then we're going to travel. Okay. Anyone else? Anything else? If you can think of anything you need to put in the bulletin, just do it with Justin. He'll be more than happy to put it in that for you. Uh, if there's nothing else, let's uh, let's stand and I'm going to ask uh, Murphy, do you mind reading some prayer? Father, thank you for this day for us to be gathered together in the house of the Lord. We ask you to watch over those names that we brought before you today. Help us to go to families, new families, and 
Get right to it this morning. I think there's other stuff coming up. So, uh, you all, know, last week we talked about Jesus' new commandment. We talked about the fact that loving each other is not really that new, but the new part of it was, was uh, you are to love one another just as I have loved you. And it's straight, it's like a whole nother level of loving each other. Right? No one had ever loved someone so much they went to a cross for them. But Jesus said that. So it's a whole new bar set, if you will, by Jesus. Uh, this week we're in a little bit later in John, in John 14, how that love unites us to Jesus, even as it needs absence. And hopefully if it unites us to Jesus, each other, because we share that common bond of, of being people that are united by Christ. All of this discussion Jesus is having, John 13, John 14, John 15, all of it's happening in the shadow of the cross. Uh, they're just a few days, like less than a week from the time when Jesus is going to be arrested. He's going to be crucified, really just a day. And so uh, the disciples don't really understand it, but Jesus does. And I've said this before, whatever you know, because the person that's about to die usually knows more about when that time's coming than anybody else. Their conversation typically shifts to what's really important. What's really important. I remember, uh, Bo, you might have been with me. We went and visited uh, Brother Ed one time, Grant Ham. He was up in the VA in the nursing home, and he, he wasn't long for this earth. And uh, I don't know if you were with me or not. I don't know. Alan and George were with me. And he talked so much about love. So much about love. And it, the thing is, it's not that he loved and didn't know about love before that, but here he saw so clearly. He shared it with me. He said, I see so clearly how important love is. Uh, and Jesus said it. He's about to leave them, and so what does he want them to understand? He wants them to understand that love is what's going to uh, to draw them together. I, I was reading this passage, y'all. This sometimes happens because Melissa will tell you if I get, if I hear a phrase, I can come up with a song. Like someone will say something, and I just start singing this. I can be country, rock, it don't matter. Like if, it, if it's a, I associate songs. And so I was reading this passage, and for some reason, Captain and Tamil kept playing in my head. You know, love will keep us. Together. Together. I never even seen Captain and Tennille. I didn't know it was. I just had to Google it. And then I saw this weird dude in like a sailor's cap at a piano. And he was playing two pianos at the same time. It was impressive. But that song was just kept playing in my head. Love will keep us together. And really the song, of course, is about romantic love and how there will be temptations and you're going to be tempted to look at it. But love is going to be the thing that keeps us together. And that's true romantic. In marriages and stuff. It's not that there's not temptations us together. But that's also especially true spiritual. It's not just romantic love. It's, it's real selfless love that keeps us committed to each other. And Jesus wants them to understand that because he's about to leave them. That whole phrase, absence makes the heart grow fonder, that's about to be put to the test. He's going to leave them twice. First, he's going to be killed. And so he's going to, he's going to leave them through death. Then he's going to be resurrected only to share with them, by the way, not going to be here very long. Because he's going to send the Father. So, but twice in a very short period of time, the person that lives for that they've committed themselves to following is going to leave. You. What's that going to do to the relationship? Now, this is relevant for us because we've never been able to walk physically in the presence of Jesus as they did. So, how do they have to adjust? How do we need to orient ourselves in order to be able to stay united with Christ? How will love keep us together? When you read in verses 23 and 24 of John 14, it says, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will follow my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our dwelling with him. The one who does not love me does not follow my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father's who sent me. Jesus saying, listen, love in that if you really love me, you're going to listen to what I say. You're going to care about my opinion on things. Even when Jesus is gone, they can still show how much they love him by doing what he asked them to do. Any of y'all ever, you got kids and you leave the house and you say, hey, I got to go somewhere. When I come back, I want this, this, and this done. 
and then you show back up and it's always done, right? Don't worry, that don't mean the kids don't love you. But Jesus is going to be gone. And whether they listen to what he says and do what he asks in his absence, that's going to be a, long, a big determining factor in, in whether or not they really love him. When he writes a letter to some Christians, uh, John, the same John who's writing the gospel here, he says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever follows his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says that he remains in him ought himself also walk just as he will. Yeah, we don't need to make it too complex. Keep his commandments. What's the commandment Jesus said? A new commandment that I give you that you love one another just as I have loved you. And so if you really love Jesus, even in his absence, you're going to keep his commandments. You're going, to, you're going to be determined to love other people and to love God. I mean, has there, has there ever been a time in our lives where someone, they leave us physically speaking, and we say, well, I don't love that person anymore. Some of y'all's parents have been gone a long time, decades. And I know for a fact, you still care very much about what they taught you. And there's still times that you draw on their wisdom. And you think about the fact that this, my mother or father would be pleased with this, or they would be pleased with this. Because you didn't put them in the grave and then say, well, I don't care anymore about what they think. No, they're absent from you for a little while. But you still care. You still care very much. I was 300 something miles away in college and I cared. You think I wanted them to have to call back home and say, come get your heathen? He can't behave? I mean, I was absent from them, but I still in my mind thought what I do reflects on my parents, even more so reflects on God. I ain't saying I was perfect, y'all. But what I'm saying is that was in my mind. Because even though they weren't standing right there by me, I very much cared what they wanted me to do, how they wanted me to live. By life. And so the physical presence of Jesus isn't necessary for us to have a relationship with him. All we got to do is act as he wants us to act. Act like him. That you love one another even as I have loved you. You know, this is the only place in the whole New Testament where it says that the Father and the Son are going to dwell in a belief. It's a unique, it's a unique state. In Revelation 3, verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and will dine with him and he with me. I can't help but think of a, my grandmother had a, it was a painting, but it almost like a hologram of Jesus standing outside a little cottage and knocking on a door. And she had it on her dresser in, in her bedroom. And I didn't know what it was at first. And then I read that passage one day and I said, that's what that painting is. That grandma's got on her on her nightstand on her dresser. It's a painting of Jesus not. And what does it mean? And obviously, we know Jesus doesn't physically jump into our hearts. Kind of like Nicodemus in John 3. How can a man be born again? Nicodemus, it ain't literal. It means that Jesus' spirit is within us if we love as Jesus love. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God remains in us, and his love is perfected in us. And then later in verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who remains in love remains in God, and God remains in him. You know, Augustine wrote, love separates the saints from the world. Wouldn't it be great if we made that truth? Wouldn't it be great if people could look at it and say, well, then people are acting real different, but in a good way, they must believe in that Jesus. Sadly, we don't live up to that statement. Sadly, sometimes we get down in the mud just like everybody else. But if we truly care about who Jesus is and what he wants us to be and how he wants us to live, then what Augustine says should be true. Love separates saints from the world. How did Jesus say that they'll know we're Christians? He said, they will know you are my disciples by your love. By your love. And so caring about what Jesus wants us to do is one way that love keeps us together. Keep reading in verses 25 and 26. These things I have spoken to you while remaining with you. But the helper, 
the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and remind you of all that I said to you. You know, one of the ways that love keeps us together is that we're able to accept help from Christ. Christ says, listen, I'm not going to leave you by yourself, clueless. He says, when I leave, I'm going to send someone else. There's going to be a helper. That phrase in the, the original language, it literally means one call to the side. Anyone ever face something and it just feels like you're standing there by yourself alone? Jesus says, my followers won't have to worry about that. You might physically be alone, but there's going to be one standing beside you, so to speak. A helper. The Holy Spirit. You know, there's an observation someone made, and I never thought about it like this. In Scripture, the Father, God, always does the sending. Jesus... Sometimes scripture refers to Jesus refers to himself, the Father sent me. So he's been sent by the Father. But other times, Jesus says, I will send you a helper. Jesus is both the one that sent, but he also sometimes sends. The Holy Spirit never is said to sin. It's just the one that sent. And so here's what, in my mind, here's how I thought about that. Like, here's the Father on this side, and here's us. And y'all probably seen cartoons or drawings like this, and there's a big gulf in between us. And so the Father sends the Son to bridge that gulf. Jesus is literally the bridge between us and the Father. And then in order to keep that relationship, Jesus, the bridge, allows the Holy Spirit sent by God over to our side. So that when it's all said and done, once you give yourself to Christ, it's the Father on one side, it's you and the Holy Spirit on the other. And Jesus is the bridge between the two. And so Jesus says, listen, I'm not going to leave you over there all by yourself without help, without aid. The spirit that he gives them is not teaching them anything new. This is all stuff they've heard. But it's helping them understand what they've been taught. Again, Augustine wrote, so then the son speaks, the Holy Spirit teaches. When the son speaks, we take in the words. When the Holy Spirit teaches, we understand those words. Any of y'all... Some of y'all might have forgotten these moments you had. Any of you younger people that have still been in school, any of y'all had other moments where you've been listening to the teacher over and over and over again, and finally it clicks? Maverick says that he hasn't had this moment. Sorry, Maverick. But one day you might. Um, I won't ask what you're going to school for so we can avoid that. Uh, but, but sometimes maybe you've been sitting there and you've been struggling over and over again, and finally you're like, oh, aha. Not because you haven't been told over and over and over again, but something kind of got you over the hump where you realized, oh, okay. For a lot of you, it's when they started throwing letters in math. Any of y'all felt like that wasn't fair? Like you felt like, okay, I'm good with the, with the numbers. Now you're throwing letters into it. You're just like, yeah, don't worry. You ain't there yet, Matt. Matt's just like, what? Letters are going to be in math? Uh, and, and you're like, what does this mean? And then slowly you start to get it. Like why are they throwing an X in there? This ain't English class. And then eventually you realize, oh, like the 57th time, it finally clicks. The knowledge that you've been receiving the whole time, you finally get it. Jesus says, that's what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And there's examples of this in Scripture. In John, Jesus said, take this temple down and it'll be rebuilt in three days. And they're like, well, that don't make any sense. We've been working on this temple for 40 years, and how are you going to tear it down and be? But then the Scripture says, in John 2, 22, so when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now, what else helped him when Jesus rose from the dead? He breathed the Holy Spirit on him. All of a sudden, the things that Jesus had said, the, the, the sayings that were in their head that were just rattling around making no sense, after they received the Spirit, they all started coming together. In John 13, Jesus answered and said to him, what I am doing, you do not realize now, but you'll understand later. But you'll understand later. There's a, a fellow way, way longer named Basil Gray. Here's what he wrote about the Spirit. And I like this. He said, the Spirit is simple in being. His powers are many. They are entirely present everywhere and in everything. He is disturbed, but does not change. He is shared yet remains whole. Consider the analogy of the sunbeam. Each person on whom its kindly light falls 
rejoice as if the sun existed for him alone. Lumens land and sea and his master. When a sunbeam falls on a transparent substance, the substance itself becomes brilliant and radiates light from itself. So too spirit bearing souls illumined by him finally become spiritual themselves and their grace is sent forth to others. I like that. The idea that the spirit is like the sunlight. And here recently, I, I remember I was standing outside when the, the sun was out and it was a beautiful day and I just, I could feel the sun on my face. Now come July, I'll probably be tired of that. When's fall getting here? But I, I was just like, and in that moment, doesn't it feel like you're just, the sun was just put there for you. To you to just bathe in its light and its warmth. Me, me enjoying the sun doesn't mean, well, sorry, there's no scarcity with the sun. There's no scarcity with the spirit. I can take in the spirit and allow it to warm my heart and it doesn't detract from your ability to take it in. And, and more than that, if I allow myself to reflect the spirit, then all of a sudden the spirit comes to me and there's even more light of it. Think about it. You can take a little bit of light and reflect it all around. By being a mirror. I remember one time I read something Max Licato said about, you know, we always want to be the sun when God actually calls us to be the moon. The moon is just a hunk of rock, but when it's in the right spot, it shines brightly because it's reflecting the light of the sun. And that's what the spirit is for us. It's, it's the glory, it's the light, it's the love of God coming to us and hopefully being reflected out to others. One more part of this, of this chapter we're going to look at, verses 27 through 29. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Do not let your hearts be troubled nor fearful. You heard that I said, and I'm coming to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it happens. So that when it happens, you may believe. Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you. You know, this is the first use of the word peace in John. And in keeping with what Jesus has said, that, you know, I'm going to be gone, but if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. I'm going to send someone that's going to help you. And Jesus says, I'm going to give you peace about it. I said, this is the first time peace comes up with John. But no discussions about peace. And I think it's interesting that peace all of a sudden pops on the radar. Like I said, that the day before Jesus was arrested and crucified, the day before they're about to enter the most tumultuous of their life, and Jesus is starting to talk about peace. Start talking about peace then. That doesn't make much sense from the world's perspective because that's, they're about to hit an unpeaceful period, right? But here's the thing says peace. He isn't saying, well, I hope, peace, man, I hope everything's all right. He's saying peace is a reality. He's saying whatever's coming down the pipe, and he knew, he knew what was coming. You are going to have peace because I'm going to make peace. And that peace is going to be available to you. He's not talking about the absence of conflict. He's talking about a wholeness that comes only from God. A wholeness that it doesn't matter what's going on around you, you are at peace. Y'all, we spend so much time and waste so much energy trying to control a bunch of variables in our life thinking that's how we're going to get peace. And it's a big game of whack-a-mole. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Well, if I, if I could just get this over here straightened out, I'd have peace. And so you take that little thing, they give you a Chuck E. Cheese or whatever, and you, and you whack it, and you're like, oh, got that, and then that little thing pops up over here. And then you're like, oh, all right, let me get this. Y'all, has there ever been a time where there wasn't something going on in your life? If there was, I guarantee you it wasn't for long, huh? Y'all, if peace only comes when there's a complete absence of anxiety or conflict or trials, I didn't like I won't. Because you ain't going to have peace. Jesus says, listen, the peace I'm going to give you, it is not tied to all these other things. All the little molds can pop up on that game. It don't matter. I got peace. Instead of trying to Keep them all bopped down. You just say, hey, whatever. Because that, that has no bearing 
on my peace, my wholeness, my relationship with God. You know, if you go to Rome to this day, there's still a, an altar to Pax Romana, the Roman peace. The Romans said, hey, if we build up enough legions, we can make peace across the whole world. And they did, at least that part of the world for a while. They bribed a Roman citizen could walk from one of the empire to the other. And no one would mess with him because he was a Roman citizen. But eventually the Roman Empire disintegrated. And the thing about it was, even when there's a Pax Romana, the only way they kept it in place was by threatening people with death. I mean, it was kind of like a, a false peace, if you will. Start something, I'll kill you. Peace. <laughs> That's not peace. That's the world's version of peace, but it's not peace. Jesus' peace doesn't come that way. It's interesting, in John 20, he appears to the disciples three times. Finally, Thomas is there, right? But when he first shows up, what does he say? Peace. You're fine. Now, maybe that's because he figures they're a little riled by the fact that they're seeing someone that they thought was dead. If someone I'd done a funeral for a couple days before showed up, I would need someone to tell me peace, too. But I wonder if part of it is him saying, you saw what they did to me. You're right. Peace. There's nothing they can do that's going to rob you of life. Oh, it might take your life for a little while, but it ain't gonna take it for good. Look at me, peace. Paul says this to the churches that he works with in Philippians. He says, Rejoice to the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all people. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and pleading, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. All those little molds that pop up that we keep trying to you just say, Lord, handle it. And you allow that peace that comes from God to guard. I love that, that, I love that image. Our hearts that sometimes can be so upset by all the things going on around us, I just see the peace of Christ guarding it, saying, no temporary trial is going to rob them of their joy, of their peace. He says it to the Colossians as well. He says, in addition to all these things, put on love. Talk about that, right? Love is what keeps us together. He says, which is the perfect bond of unity. Let the peace of Christ, to which you are indeed called in one body, Rule in your hearts and be thankful. Let peace rule in your hearts. Y'all, we got to guard our hearts. We're not careful. We're going to let a whole bunch of junk in, a whole bunch of stuff that's going to upset and bring turmoil to our life. Paul says, Jesus went to the cross. He achieved your eternal salvation. How can you not be at peace? Let peace rule in your heart. The beauty of Christ is that because of Christ together. <clears throat> but that's only if you determine you're not going to be a slave to circumstance. You can be a slave to circumstance and say, well, I'll have peace when I get all this stuff straightened out. Or you can say, because of what Christ has done, I'm going to take his word seriously. I'm going to receive his help in the form of the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to receive his peace. You know, I think about we've got graduates here that we're celebrating the whole world. You're all about to go out into the world and you've got to make a whole bunch of decisions. Maybe you'll stay close to home, maybe you'll go far away. There's gonna be a whole, whole bunch of things that are going to try to this is what you need to feel whole in life. And they're mirages. They're mirages. Ask people here who have been down those roads, who have tried to find peace and wholeness on the they're mirages. You, can, you have to make a decision now. And trust me, it's easier now than get down the road further. That you're not going to be a slave to circumstance. My peace is not going to be determined by whether or not I get this job or get into this school or have this relationship or have this car. All that stuff. It's nice, but that stuff can't bring you peace because it's temporary. Jobs are temporary. School, temporary. Relationships, temporary. You might meet your soulmate and live for peace, but one of you is going to leave this earth before the other one. Is your peace going to leave at that moment? 
It's not that those things are bad, but you cannot buy peace. Do not tie your peace to circumstance. Now you can have the whole world and not have Christ, and you ain't gonna have peace. In many ways, you'll, you'll have nothing. Or you can have nothing with Jesus and be completely Which one are you gonna choose? Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for your son, Jesus Christ. Father, with all the people in this room, there's so many things that cause us anxiety, so many things that are trials, and things that we're forced to overcome in this life, and it's so easy for all of us to be fooled into thinking that we have to have no challenges, no anxiety in our peace. Father, remind us that the, the one thing that's the most important of all, our relationship with you, that your son Jesus took care of that. And that because of that, we can have peace. Father, that even in Christ's absence from us, that love holds us together. And so, Father, we ask that you will give us the ability to attend to the will of Jesus in our lives. Father, help us to love just as he's instructed us to love. Father, help us to receive the help that he gives us in the form of your spirit. Father, most of all, help us to receive the gift of peace that comes from Christ. Father, I pray especially for these graduates this morning, for the decisions that they'll make in the coming days and years. Father, I pray that always, somewhere in their mind, they'll remember that your son, Jesus Christ, gives peace that surpasses everything else this world can offer them. We pray that that wisdom and that knowledge will go with them. Wherever they find themselves, whatever their circumstances may remember, that your son, Jesus, has secured their peace. Help them to receive it. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand and sing a song. Uh, I just learned this song a few years ago, but I thought it was a perfect song for us to conclude with this morning. So if there's any way we can help you, we'd invite you to come as we stand and sing uh, Peace, Perfect Peace. <clears throat> peace, perfect peace In this dark world of sin The blood Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, by thronging duties press to do the will of Jesus. This is rest. Peace, perfect peace. With sorrow surging round on Jesus, whose own not but calm is found. Peace, perfect peace, with loved ones far away in Jesus, keeping we are safe. And they peace, perfect peace, our future of unknown. Jesus, we know when He is on the throne. It is enough, earth struggles shall. And Jesus call us to hands perfect peace. If you got social media, uh, share. Love will keep us together. Some hashtags down there if you want to share those um, here in a minute uh, after we're dismissed in prayer. Uh, just have a seat. We've got to go switch the computers out and set up the slideshow. Like I said, we'll have our slideshow, then we'll call our graduates up here. Uh, have a prayer uh, over them, a prayer for the food, and then we'll move over there into the fellowship hall. Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Matt Jr., would you dismiss us in prayer? Dear God, we thank you so much for letting us gather here today to study your word. We pray that you'll be with each one of us to do the Lord's prayer. Is that we bless your prayers. We know each one of them needs. We pray that you'll be with us. Give you the word for us. We pray that you'll be with us. <laughs> these are these young people that are graduating this day as they go out into the world to continue their lives. Pray that you'll be with.
willing that they will open their hearts to you and direct their actions. Just be with us and keep us safe. Thank you, people, each one of us. Be with us as we go on to our rest of the activities today. And in this name of Christ, amen. Yes. All right, y'all be seated. We'll go ahead and get everything switched over real quick. Jacob. Jacob. Mm -hmm. 